Coming in at number 5 we have Ross Island. Located on an island in India closer to Southeast Asia than India, the island is known for beautiful beaches, unique marine life, coral reefs and largely undisturbed forests. But beyond the islands beautiful views and stunning wildlife lies a dark past. Ross Island is one of the 572 islands that make up the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Now the island is a ghost town where the remnants of a 19th century British settlement lie in ruins. In 1857, reacting to an unanticipated Indian revolt, the British Empire chose remote islands as the site of a penal colony. And Ross Island was one of them. The British first arrived in 1858 with 200 Indian convicts. The deadly task of clearing the thick jungle fell upon the inmates, while the officers stayed on the ships. Moreover, the development and town built at Ross Island began in 1858 and the prisoners were forced to build its buildings. The island was transformed to resemble a British town, with houses, offices, clubhouses, bakeries, stores, churches and everything else that the British would not miss when they were away from home. The British ruled Ross Island for more than 80 years up until nature was against the development. In 1941, a gigantic earthquake affected the island and left the town on the island completely ruined. The British thought rebuilding the town would not be worth it and overnight left the island in complete ruins. Abandoned in the 1940s, the island is now being reclaimed by nature. Homes, a massive church, ballrooms and even a graveyard all are in varying stages of decomposition, being taken over by an unyielding forest. In at number 4 we have Tlingua, Texas. Near the Mexican border you will find the town of Tlingua, Texas. In the 1800s it was discovered that the area in which Tlingua was built was plentiful in cinnabar, a red mercury sulphide, from which mercury can be extracted. This caused an influx of miners to the area, but it wasn't until Jack Dawson's discovery and production of the area's first mercury in 1888 that it drew a population of 2000, and by 1900 there were 4 mining companies in the area. When the Chizos mining company opened in the mid 1800s, workers and their families quickly relocated to the Tlingua, Texas. The Chisos Mining Company was founded and began operations in 1903 near Tlingua, Texas. The company specialized in the extraction of quicksilver and mercury. In 1799, Charles Harvard discovered that compounding the element produced fulminate mercury crystals, establishing its marketability. These crystals are useful in the production of gunpowder cartridges and shells. Mercury production had peaked during the First World War began to fall, thus Chiso's mining company had filed for bankruptcy and the miners began to trickle out. When the mine went bankrupt in 1942, Perry sold it and moved away. The population was around 3,000 at its peak, though it said that everyone up and left the municipality in the 1940s once the mercury was picked through. Thus, the once busy city became the ghost town we know today. It is now home to 110 people. By the end of the war, it was an abandoned ghost town. In at number 3 we have Kennecott, Alaska. It once flew flourishing town with businesses, shops, a train and a lively community is now left as a ghost town. The town of Kennecott in Alaska was flooded with people after copper was discovered in 1900. After the discovery, a group of wealthy investors formed the Kennecott Copper Corporation to mine the mountains above the Kennecott and Root glaciers. In the 27 years the mine was in full operation, the company and town grew significantly in fortune and people, and at its peak Kennecott employed 600 people. But by 1938 the copper was mostly gone, the mine was shut down and the town was left abandoned. The town was abruptly abandoned by its citizens, leaving most of their possessions behind. Since the middle of the 1950s the place had been completely deserted, with the railroad discontinued service that same year. Reports of ghosts along the abandoned tracks of the Kennecott train have been claimed for decades, while other visitors report having seen old tombstones along the route of the tracks, though the gravestones then vanish by the time the visitors make their return trip. Others have reported hearing disembodied voices and phantom children laughing. Reportedly a 1990s construction project were halted after workers were scared away by the creepy sounds and unexplainable events. In at number 2 we have Exunan Tunich, Belize. I hope that's how you say it. Deep in the jungle of Belize lies an ancient ruins of an abandoned town that has been left to crumble. The town has been left abandoned for over 1000
thousand years, though before the abandonment of this large and populated town, Xunatunic was a thriving metropolis. The first construction at the site dates back to sometime in 200 AD, with the growth of the town continuing until its final days of functioning as a city. The town grew to consist of many temples and palaces, including its largest and most recognizable known as El Castillo. Xunatunic has lied abandoned since around 1000 AD. It is thought that due to consistent devastating events such as an earthquake and other natural disasters, caused the sudden evacuation of the large Mayan city around 700 AD. The disaster caused extensive damage to the main pyramid of Xunatunic. Although the city was reoccupied some time after, it only remained active for another 300 years before it was left completely unoccupied. After abandonment, the site remained empty, eventually being encapsulated by the surrounding jungle and nature, until it was rediscovered by explorers in the early 1890s. The name Xunatunic comes from the ghost stories that have haunted the ghost town for years. The ghost story of Xunatunic is rumoured to start in 1893 after the first sighting of the ghost happened. The first ghost sighting goes as one morning a man who was part of a research team working on the site saw what he described as a Mayan maiden ascending the staircase of the Xunatunic's main pyramid. This vision caught him by surprise so he continued to watch as the woman walked further up the stairs. Suddenly she stopped and turned to look at the man where he was able to get a glimpse of her glowing red eyes that pierced his soul. She then turned to continue her climb to the top of the pyramid where she would disappear amongst its stone columns. The shocked man quickly assembled a team to search for this woman, yet no trace of her was ever found. Since this sighting, countless more visitors have reported to also spot the ghostly maiden who haunts Exuna Tunich. She is always described to be ascending El Castillo's stairs. To this day, the sightings and reports from visitors continue. The ghost frequency is what gives Exuna Tunich its name, which translates to the Stone Lady in the Maya language. Some believe that this Maya maiden have formerly lived within the city many years ago. Others believe that she was a human sacrifice, trapped to relive her last moments of ascending to the top of the pyramid where her ritual would have been conducted. Then there are a few who believe her to be some sort of ancient godly spirit linked to the site and the Mayan culture. And finally, in at number one, we have Calico, California. The ghost town of Calico can be found in California, midway between Barstow and Yermo. The beginning of the town started in 1875 and was built under the impression that there were prospects for silver in the Calico Mountains. But in the spring of 1883, many of the local miners left Calico when borax was discovered three miles east at Borate. Though Calico again boomed in 1884 as additional silver discoveries were made. Gaining a population of some 2,500, the town supported two dozen saloons and gambling dives that never closed, as well as more establishments such as the church, public school, dance school and a literary society along with dozens of retail businesses. By the late 1800s Calico was bustling with prospectors searching for their fortunes and the Calico mining district became one of the richest in the state. Calico's final decline began when the price of silver fell in the 1890s, but the brake production kept it alive, even through the panic of 1906. They tried to hold on and borax for a time substituted for the shiny metal that had been the Calico's fortune. Calico kept churning out valuable minerals until it finally exhausted its supply in the 1920s. Calico was soon abandoned and left to gradually decay in the desert sun until little remained. But in 1951 it was purchased by the Walter Knott, an ex-miner and rebuilt as a modern ghost town. He restored the town to mostly how it was, in certain cases rebuilding some of the old structures as they were back in the 1880s. Considered one of the top haunted locations in California, Calico has its fair share of ghost stories, when one of the most active and known ghosts of the abandoned town is Lucy Lane. Lucy is often seen in a black lace dress walking back and forth between her home and store. Others have allegedly seen phantom school teachers and other residents who have been known to grab visitors legs or pinch their ankles. Some visitors have also reported seeing a floating red light inside the buildings, while other visitors have reported extreme cold spots throughout the mine and an eerie feeling in various places of the town. In at number 5 we have St Elmo, Colorado. St Elmo, Colorado was a former gold mining camp in Chaffee country. Today it is one of the best preserved ghost towns in Colorado as the entire district was placed on the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. The area was originally settled in 1878 and was made official in 1880 when gold and silver began to bring many people to the area. At one point the population reached more than 2,000 people. In 1881 the Denver South Park and Pacific Railroad came through the area and a station was built in St. Elmo. From here the tracks continued to Romney Hancock and through the historic Alpine Tunnel. St. Elmo was considered the main source of supplies arriving by train for the area settlers and eventually several merchandise stores, five hotels, a telegraph office, a town hall, five restaurants, two sawmills,
Wales, a schoolhouse, a weekly newspaper called The Mountaineer, and numerous saloons and dance halls filled the town. The miners worked at several mines throughout the area that were rich in silver, gold, copper, and iron. In 1890, a fire destroyed the business section, and the town was never entirely rebuilt. This was about the same time that St. Elmo's peaked in population with about 2,000 residents. Afterward, many of the mines were depleted, and many miners moved out of the area. More mines continued to fail in the ensuing years, and the closure of the Alpine Tunnel in 1910. The state of the structures paired with depleting mines led many in the community in search of new, more prosperous mining towns to call home. The railroad continued to run until 1922, and it has been said that the rest of St. Elmo's population rode the last train out of town, never to return. In 1969, the United States recognized St. Elmo as a historic district, and soon after, it became a unique tourist attraction that's open to the public, showcasing what life was like in the Old West. There is no shortage of urban legends and reports of hauntings in St. Elmo, but the most common occurrence of paranormal activity centers around the town's most notable family. To this day, one of the members of the Stark family still can be spotted in the ghost town. Anton's only daughter, Annabelle, resided there until she died in 1960. As legend has it, Annabelle continued her promise to protect the city even after she took her last breath. In at number 4 we have Rhyolite, Nevada. Founded in 1904 and abandoned by 1916, Rhyolite was one of several short-lived boom towns from the late gold rush era. People were drawn to the desert on the edge of Death Valley by the promise of gold found amongst quartz in local mines. And by 1906 the town had all the promising indicators of permanence and the largest population in the area. The town citizens had an active social life, including baseball games, dances, basket socials, whist parties, tennis, a symphony, Sunday school picnics, basketball games, Saturday night variety shows at the Opera House, and pool tournaments. In 1906, Countess Majoski opened the Alaska Glacier Ice Cream Parlor to the delight of the local citizenry. That same year, an enterprising miner, Tom T. Kelly, built a bottle house out of 50,000 beer and liquor bottles. But in 1907, the US financial markets were rocked by a panic that saw closures of banks, businesses, and mines. Rhyolite began to falter. The mine closed in 1911. Some claim that Rhyolite, about 120 miles northwest of Las Vegas, was once home to thousands of people, though not much remains of its glory days, which lasted less than 20 years. Set up in 1905, the town was a mining hotspot. But after the richest ore was exhausted, workers left for a new pasture, and the population had dropped to close to zero by 1920. Industrialist Charles M. Schwab invested heavily in Rhyolite's infrastructure, which boasted a school, electric lights, water mains, newspapers, a hospital, and even an opera house, some of which can be seen today. There are only around 10 significant structures, yet the site is very evocative. The crumbling remains set against a backdrop of stark desert hills. In at number 3 we have Jazarat Al Hamra, which is best known as the ghost town of the United Arab Emirates, is said to be the country's most haunted place, remaining a number of spooky events experienced by the locals and curious visitors. Jazarat Al Hamra is an abandoned village located to the south of the city of Ras Al Kamar, one of the seven emirates that form the UAE. The coastal territory is the region's best example of a pre-oil village, displaying three distinct types of early and mid 20th century Gulf architecture. The town of Ras Al Kamar is the crumbling remains of a once thriving fishing village. The name translates to Red Island for the red and bronze color of the sand on which the town was built. The former tidal island was predominantly home to the Zab tribe, who by 1831 developed the area into a renowned pearling trade center. It was home to over 4,000 inhabitants and dozens of fishing and trading ships, and with its good fortune came expansion that continued well into the start of the 20th century. But by 1968, Al Jazarat Al Hamra became nothing more than an abandoned town. Due to a clash between the tribe and Sheikh Saka bin Mohammed of Ras Al Kamar, due to some unclear reasons, thus most of them migrated to Abu Dhabi. The village consisted of 334 buildings, including 18 shops and 11 mosques, and is nearly unchanged since its people left in 1968. Al Jazarat Al Hamra, now filled in patch of land in the south of Ras Al Kamar, remained abandoned and untouched. However, rumor has it that this extraordinary, quiet, and silent village is extremely haunted by the jinns. People even got that they can hear the strange noise and disembodied voices near the beach of this ghost village. Many visitors also assert that they felt uneasy like danger was lurking, waiting for them when they pressed on further into the haunted village. Some of them even claim to have reported seeing unexplainable handprints on the ruined pillars and walls and experienced many more paranormal things within this haunted ghost town. In at number 2 we have Pyramid in Norway. Some say that the Soviet town of Pyramid in Norway was abandoned overnight and for a good reason. Located in Svalbard, an archipelago situated between Norway 
Norway and the North Pole. Pyramiden can be reached by boat from about mid May until the beginning of October, when waters bordering the town are free from sea ice. Established in the 17th century, the town was used as a base for whaling and walrus trapping. Though at the start of the 20th century, the culture shifted to coal mining. At first, Pyramiden was a sleepy place with hardly any residents at all, but after World War II, the Soviets allocated more money to the town. They constructed dozens of new buildings, including a hospital, a recreation center called the Cultural Palace, and a large cafeteria. In the 1980s, the town's population reached its peak of more than 1,000 people. But not long, due to the wake of the Soviet Union's dissolution, the town would be left completely abandoned. As when the Soviet Union fell apart, mining stopped in Pyramiden, and the miners had to leave. On March 31st, 1998, the last coal was extracted from the mine, and the approximately 300 workers who still lived there began shipping out. The residents never returned, and today the town still stands much as it was when the last men departed. And finally, in at number one, we have Batstow Village, New Jersey. There are around 28 known ghost towns in New Jersey, but this one has to be the most terrifying. Founded in 1766, the Batstow Village was built primarily to accommodate once prosperous ironworks. At the time, the site possessed three valuable resources water for mills, abundant wood for charcoal, and naturally occurring bog iron. During the Revolutionary War, Batstow supplied the Continental Army with iron, while its remoteness protected it from British attack. In 1784, Batstow was bought by William Richard, whose family owned and operated the ironworks for 92 years. Following the discovery of coal and ore in Pennsylvania, in the 1840s, the iron industry began to dwindle in the Batso village. Nervous they were going to run out of business, the Richards family exploited another abundant local resource, sand, to make glass. But in 1874, a house fire spread and destroyed the glass making facilities, remaining furnaces, and 17 houses that were in the town. Due to the destruction of the glass facilities, the town of Batso and the Richards family fell into bankruptcy. The Richards and many of the villagers moved away after the accident, leaving the site silent. In 1876, the property, along with huge tracts of land around it, was purchased by industrialist and businessman Joseph Wharton. With the plan of reinventing the declining town into an agricultural, foresting, and cranberry farm. But after his death in 1909, the land was held by a trust until purchased by the state in 1954 to form the Wharton State Forest. The state's plan for the town was to restore its 50 room mansion as well as to rebuild the dam that was located on the lake. Though the efforts to reinvent Batso weren't enough to save it from its inevitable end. As when the state of New Jersey bought the village with a plan of improving it, the residents didn't see a future in the town, so they all left it. With roots that can be traced back to 1766 and the last remaining resident leaving in 1989. There are more than 40 structures still standing in the historic town, including a charcoal kiln, carriage houses, stables, ice and milk houses, a blacksmith general store, grist mill, and a wheelwright shop, though they are all left untouched since the last residents left in 1989. In the number five spot, we have the Royal Garden Subdivision out in Hawaii. This spot is on the Big Island southeastern shore and in the shadow of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. In the early 80s, the Royal Gardens were extremely high in value because of their breathtaking views. But then in March of 1983, there was a volcano eruption and that ripped through the town. And the people living there, they weren't that happy. Moving on to the number four spot, we have Jerome, Arizona. Now, this is an old mining town that is historically haunted. Once a booming copper camp, it was the fourth largest city in Arizona in the late 1920s. When the mines closed in the mid 1950s, well, then the population dropped drastically. Yeah, only 42 people remained in the town. Since then, it's become notorious for paranormal activity. There's all sorts of ghost sightings, and also things will often move on their own. Like you might put a glass on a table and just gone. By itself. Moving on to the number three spot, we have Kea Koi Alatola out in Turkey. Hope I said that right. At one time, the village was inhabited by 2,000 plus Greek Orthodox citizens. In 1923, following World War I and the Greco Turkish War, Greece and Turkey agreed to a compulsory population exchange based on religious ideology, forcing Greek Orthodox citizens of Turkey and the Muslim citizens of Greece to move. When that happened, the village was practically abandoned. Yeah, it now serves as a museum for the fallen Ottoman Empire. I don't know what the hell that is, but my cameraman does. Next up at number two, we have Pripey, Ukraine. The city was originally founded to house workers of the Chernobyl nuclear power plant. It was only three miles away. On April 26, 1986, the entire city was evacuated due to an explosion and subsequent radiation leak at Chernobyl. Basically, think of Homer Simpson not doing his job 
and all of Springfield having to get the hell out of Dodge. Finally, in the number one spot, we have Hashima Island out in Japan. Located 20 kilometers off the port of Nagasaki, this once had the highest population density in history of Japan, with more than 5,000 full time residents, despite the island only being 480 meters long and 150 meters wide. It was a coal mine built with residencies so people could build a family. The thing basically looked like a battleship, and that's what people referred to it as. When the mine was closed in April of 1974, residents had to vacate the island, and it remained closed to the public for many years, slowly deteriorating from typhoons and lack of upkeep. Slowly, it is becoming a tourist attraction, and to me, it looks like an amazing place to play capture the flag or have an epic paintball gun fight. Number five on this list is Pripyat, Ukraine. Once a growing and bustling Ukrainian city, Pripyat is now a shell of its former self and likely haunted. Located in northern Ukraine and about 90 kilometers from the capital of Kiev, the town used to have a community of 50,000 people. But in 1986, the Chernobyl power plant had a horrible disaster and the nuclear fallout that ensued was catastrophic. The plant had four nuclear reactors and on April 26, 1986, reactor number four blew up during a test. The Soviets were initially reluctant to make the disaster public but had no choice when nuclear reactors a thousand miles away in eastern Sweden began recording radiation levels ten times higher than normal. Fire from the explosion had sent plumes of highly radioactive fallout across the USSR and Europe. Being just two kilometers away from the Chernobyl nuclear power plant, Pripyat and its residents was dangerously close to the nuclear fallout. The human body isn't made to withstand that level of radiation and all areas near the blast had to be evacuated immediately. The town the town of Pripyat and all of its tens of thousands of residents was no exception. Decades have passed and this place has been eaten alive by time with no human intervention. With the horrible radiation followed as well, who knows what sort of creatures are lurking here now. Its buildings have decayed and been partially reclaimed by the elements and wild animals that roam through apartments people used to call home, sports complexes and amusement parks. In the town post office, hundreds of letters from 1986 still sit waiting to be mailed. While radiation levels in Pripyat have dropped enough in recent years to allow former residents to make brief visits, scientists estimate that it could take several centuries before the town is once again safe for habitation. Number 4 on this list is Gukajima, Japan. Being 480 meters in length and 160 meters wide, this small island holds a lot of history and ghost stories. Just 15 kilometers from Nagasaki and in front of the Japanese coastline. In the late 1950s, the island had a population of over 5,200 people. The people that resided in the Gukunjima Island were mostly coal miners and their families. Since the island is so small at its peak in population, it was once the most densely populated place on the planet nine times the population density of Tokyo. Now the island is left completely abandoned and is effectively crumbling to pieces. The coal mining facility was previously called a Battleship Island because its buildings and seawall make it resemble a warship. As for the island's fate, it was abandoned in the 1970s when petroleum fuels made coal obsolete. But abandoned does not mean empty, because the ghosts of the past have taken over the island and its buildings. The buildings were built by Korean and Chinese prisoners who were forced to work here from 1930 to just after World War II. The conditions of these forced laborers were hard, and some never made it back home. The people who worked here named the island Jail Island, or even Hell Island. After the war, the Japanese came to the island to work here themselves. In 1974, the mines started to run out of coal and people left the island. Soon, the island's uninhabited parts were reclaimed by nature. The weather conditions started affecting the concrete and buildings started falling apart. Sometimes, people camped out here, but that was a very dangerous thing to do. The government wanted to discourage people from going over on their own and therefore decided to make it open to the public. Even though tourists are allowed to visit the island today, the echoes of the past still linger here, especially in the minds of the relatives of those forced laborers that have been forced to work here and inside of the crumbling buildings. Fishermen who sail near the island claim they have seen strange flickering lights in the buildings, even though the island has no electricity. Strange noises have been heard and cold spots have been felt. People say they had the sensation of being watched and there are some claims of people that have been touched by unseen hands. Nowadays, people who have visited say the decaying settlement contains so many items from the 70s that it almost looks as if people still live there. Day trippers beware, though as exploring Hashim 
Fukushima takes organization and many of the building structures are dangerously unstable. Number 3 on this list is Deception Island in Antarctica. Deception Island can be found just off the northwest Antarctic Peninsula in the South Shetland Islands. The island itself is quite remote and can only be reached by ship. The island was once known for being the safest harbour in Antarctica and used as a sealing and whaling station, having interested Britain, Chile and Argentina for a place of science and military. Where Britain ended up using it as a military base but not for so but not for long as it was deserted when volcanic activity destroyed it in 1960. Today, Deception Island is a popular Antarctic tourism destination and a scientific outpost for summer research teams from Spain and Argentina. With a history rich in destruction and conflict, the horseshoe shaped landmass can leave visitors with more than a touch of nostalgia and even the uneasy feeling that the island is true to its name, that something here is not as it seems. Since it's been abandoned, the island is known to be a paranormal active hotspot, as many of the ghosts of Deception Island are plain to see with abandoned scientific research stations, airplane hangars, whaling operations and military bases being scattered around the island. Many who have visited Deception Island have said they felt uncomfortable, as though they're not alone in more ways than one, with many visitors having heard strange voices seemingly coming out of nowhere. Others claim to have seen shadowy figures, strange orbs of light are commonly seen there as well, only adding to the mystery and intrigue of such a place. With no immediate way to escape the island, making the risks of visiting the island and interacting with paranormal activity a little scarier. Number 4 on this list is Krakow, Italy. Even though the residents of Krakow, Italy are long gone, the town on the hill remains abandoned. Located atop a 1,300 foot cliff overlooking the river valley below, the town was founded in the 8th century. Krakow is only 40 kilometers inland from the Gulf of Taranto and a part of Italy's Basilica region. The first written evidence of the town's existence shows that it was under the possession of a bishop named Arnaldo in 1060 AD. The town's oldest building, the tall Tor Normana, uh -huh predates the bishop's documented ownership by 20 years. The city emptied due to various natural disasters. In 1963, the people of Krakow, Italy saw its first substantial landslide, though life went on and the town kept on expanding. Then another tragedy hit. In 1656, the Black Death began to spread, where hundreds died and the population dipped. Though the town lived on, in 1972 a flood made conditions even more precarious. Despite living conditions being harsh and dangerous, as well as numerous bandit raids, there there were still many residents who refused to leave their beautiful city. Though in 1980 an earthquake caused the town to be abandoned in its entirety. Now Krakow is effectively a ghost town reduced to nothing but ancient ruins for half a century. It's an eerie look at a once thriving village that's now known as a ghost town. The oldest part of Krakow built on solid bedrock still remains standing. As beautiful as Krakow is, the land and location have proven not suitable for habitation. From its rich tragic history and frozen in time as a medieval town, it's only safe to assume that the town is haunted by its past. And finally number one on this list is Kencott, Alaska. Built in 1903, the town of Kencott was once bustling with people full of workers who came to the town in search of wealth and work in the mines. There were businesses, shops, a train connection and a lot of life. Then in 1938, the town was abruptly abandoned by its citizens, leaving most of their possessions behind. Since the middle of the 1950s, the place has been completely deserted. In the Kencott mines, it was not gold that people were digging for, like in so many other places, but copper. After copper was discovered in the area in 1900, a group of wealthy investors formed the Kencott Copper Corporation to mine the incredibly rich veins in the Jagged Mountains. In the 27 years, the mine was in full operation. The company made more than 100 million and a company town grew around the mine. It grew quickly into a major town with a school, a hospital, a saloon and a brothel. But by 1938, the copper deposits were mostly gone, the mine was shut down and the town was abandoned. The railroad discontinued service that same year. Over the years, visitors exploring the ghost town and Kencott historical landmarks have claimed they've seen tombstones just off the old dirt path and in places where the old copper railroad used to be. Widespread and well-known stories of hauntings along the old railway track have been reported from the region. Back in the late 1990s, the state of Alaska was said to have begun developing a government housing tract out along the trail that once marked the old copper railroads. But during construction, workers so regularly recounted phantom visions and disembodied voices of both children and adults 
adults along the old copper railroad that keeping work up became impossible. Eventually things got even worse, with construction workers having seen the tombstones and heard the wails of the past miners. In addition, the workers started losing their tools right out of their tool belts and boxes. It was enough to frighten off even the boldest and bravest public workers that the whole project had to be cancelled. Coming in at number 5 we have Bodie, California. Located up in the Bodie Hills in Mono County, California near Yosemite, in 1859 four miners found a good place to look for gold in the hills near the California. Nevada border. Bodhi died in a blizzard not long after, but a small mining town sprung up at their camp. The town was home to 10,000 people. Bodhi was a mining camp in 1859 where people had seen gold in its hills. Eventually, it turned to a well populated town. Though, like most mining towns, it saw its peak, its losses, and then its decline. Fast forward to 1962 and the town would be fully abandoned. Although it already showed signs of decline with dwindling numbers at the start of the 20th century. A series of fires forced the last remaining residents to flee the town, leaving it almost exactly as it was in the early 1900s. Dinner tables are still set up, shops are still stocked with supplies, and restaurants are still poised to serve long forgotten meals. Today, the 110 silent building sits spaced out for traffic and people that aren't there. Buildings such as a barbershop, a church, a mill, a morgue, and a leaning hotel is held up by a beam have been left untouched for 100 years. Though since it has been left and abandoned for years some of the buildings are in crumbing state of decay, while others stand strong full of their original items but long devoid of their owners. There were also 16 saloons and thus a fair amount of danger. People were robbed and crimes occurred quite often, though the curse of Bodhi has nothing to do with the fires or the shootings. It started because people started taking artifacts from the abandoned buildings. They take weather worn shoes or pieces of glass from shattered windows somebody once ran off with a piano. Those items may seem like they have no value but all objects carry equal significance in telling the story of Bodhi. Thus, the curse of Bodhi emerged where if you take something from Bodhi, bad luck will come around to get you. Because of the rumour spreading of a curse, people who stole items would send them back, often including heartfelt apology letters explaining that they didn't expect their fish to pass, or their romantic life to tank from stealing from Bodhi. Coming in at number 4 we have Bannock, Montana. The once bright star of Montana is now a ruin, a town in arrested decay, with few remaining storefronts saloons and hotels. The town was founded in 1862 when a group of Pikes Peakers from the gold fields of Colorado set up camp on the banks of the creek, finding gold that miners staked claims and promptly failed to keep the find a secret. By the spring of 1863 the area boasted a population of 5,000. By 1864 Bannock had started to fade, losing importance. The remnants of the past still exist with empty buildings and weathered wood. Today over 60 structures remain standing, most of which can be explored. The town is known as a site for paranormal activity. It is known that ghosts of the abandoned town walk the streets of Bannock. The most common ghost story though is the story of Dorothy Dunn. In August 1916, Dorothy Dunn, her cousin Fern and a friend waded into a dredge pond and stepped into deep water, but none of the three knew how to swim. Luckily a passerby was able to save both Fern and the friend, but Dorothy was not as lucky. Today the site of the tragic drowning is referred to as Dorothy's Hole. Some one time after the accident, Bertie saw a ghost of her friend upstairs in the hotel of the town. She recognised Dorothy by her long blue dress. Although Bertie rarely discussed the sightings, other visitors began to report seeing the spirit of a young girl in a long blue dress in the window of the hotel. Others have reported cold spots and some have reported trying to speak to the girl in a long blue dress. Bannock was filled with adult workers, crimes, murders and of course the notorious sheriff and outlaw Henry Plummer, whose vast gang terrorised and robbed southwest Montana for years. Henry Plummer was handsome, well dressed and charismatic. He was also able to gain the trust of the area miners and was soon elected sheriff of the community. However, little did the citizens of Bannock know, but their new sheriff led a secret band of road agents called the Innocents who began to terrorise the travellers between Bannock and Virginia City, robbing and ending more than 100 men over the next several months. Once caught for his terrible actions, Henry Plummer met his fatal end at the hands of the town citizens. Today many say that the ghost of Henry Plummer haunts this old settlement, perhaps he wants to avenge his name. 
In at number 3 we have Thurmond, West Virginia. The historic town of Thurmond, located in the heart of New River Gorge, was established by Captain William D. Thurmond in the 1880s. Captain Thurmond passed in 1910 but the town continued its growth. During its height in the 1920s the town was flourishing with a number of businesses and facilities in the railway industry. Thurmond had two banks, two hotels, stores, a cinema and offices, yet after a series of setbacks, Thurmond soon went from boom to bust. A number of factors played a role in the town's slow decline. The first problem was the increased rail competition and the emergence of cars. Then in 1930, a fire that led to the closure of the biggest hotel in the town, the Dunglen Hotel, only furthered the decline. The final fate of the town was the Great Depression, and by 1950, Thurmond was a ghost town. Thurmond saw a small revival during World War II when coal was in high demand, but it was not enough. Afterward, the coal fields began to play out. Today, Thurmond stands at just five person population, which is why it is nearly vacant ghost town, as the remaining residents either move on or pass away. The house and the land it sits on became the property of the National Park Service. Walking around Thurmond today is a sad reminder of the countless other boom towns which once thrived with human activity, but today are silent and forgotten. Many buildings have long since disappeared, either torn down or as in the case of the well-loved hotel, burnt to the ground in suspicious circumstances. Many of the family homes lie in increasingly decaying condition, while some have disappeared altogether, leaving only behind a white picket fence and wildflowers, which still blossom untended each year. The eerie atmosphere of Thurmond led many visitors to believe that this almost abandoned town is haunted. In at number 2 we have Cahaba Ghost Town. Alabama is home to many small towns. While some of these towns have very few residents, others are true ghost town because they've been completely abandoned. It's no secret that small abandoned towns give off an eerie vibe. As a matter of fact, one Alabama ghost town in particular that fits the bill is Old Cahaba. The small town of Old Cahaba is located in Dallas County. From 1820 to 1826, this small town served as Alabama's first state capital. Before the Civil War, Cahaba was a busy trade city located at the junction of the Alabama and Cahaba rivers. Over the years, floods and decay have affected this historical town. Thus, by 1900, the town was completely abandoned. Today, Old Cahaba is Alabama's most famous ghost town. Many buildings still stand, like the church, schoolhouse, and some houses. However, they have been left untouched for decades. You can still walk the streets of Cahaba and see the ruins and abandoned buildings, but make sure to keep your eyes peeled for the ghostly orbs that have been reported to appear in the garden maze at the home of C.C. Peggs. Additionally, many locals share similar ghost stories from the ghost town. While it's known that Cahaba is filled with paranormal activity, one groundskeeper that works at the new Cahaba cemetery has reported hearing voices as they worked. While tourist groups claim to have recordings of unusual sounds, and others say they've captured unexplained lights or shadows in photographs. Another site that's reportedly haunted is the Barker House. This mansion was built in 1860 by Stephen Barker and contained slave quarters behind the house. After people started leaving the town in 1870s, the house was bought by Sam Samuel McGurdy Kirkpatrick. It burned in 1935 and was rebuilt, but today it's in pretty bad condition. The only people usually left inside are paranormal investigators. Reports from said investigators include seeing a ball rolling across the floor on its own and a stuffed animal appearing to communicate with something else in the room. But the most well known haunting in Cahaba is Pegg's ghost. Colonel Christopher Claudius Peggs was the leader of the 5th Alabama Regiment and was wounded leading a charge at the Battle of Seven Pines in Virginia in May 18. He died from his wounds two months later on July 15th. As the story goes, a couple were walking behind Peg's home in the spring of 1862. As they walked, they spotted a ball of light. They tried to touch it, but their hands went right through it. It disappeared, but later came back and followed the couple. Due to all the mysterious crimes that happened in association to Peg, seeing an orb around his former house is considered a bad omen and possibly even a supernatural warning. And finally, in at number one, we have Centralia, Pennsylvania. Located in a quiet valley of Columbia County, Pennsylvania, is one of the state's least likely and least publicized tourist attractions. Centralia, Pennsylvania once thriving with 14 active coal mines and 2,500 residents in the early 20th century. But by the 1960s, its thriving business and population hit a decline, and most of its mines were abandoned. Still at that point, over 1,000 people still resided in the town, and Centralia was far from dying until a coal mine fire began below. In 1962, a fire started in a landfill and spread to the never-ending coal tunnels that miners dug thousands of feet below the surface. And despite repeated attempts to extinguish the flames, the fire still burns to this day. 20 years after the fire started, however, Centralia, Pennsylvania began to feel the effects of its underground fire. 
as residents started passing out in their homes from carbon monoxide poisoning. The trees began to die and the ground turned to ash. Roads and sidewalks began to buckle. But some residents didn't want to leave despite the health risks. And for the next 10 years, legal battles and personal arguments between neighbours became the norm. The local newspaper even published a weekly list of who was leaving. Finally, Pennsylvania invoked eminent domain in 1993, by which point only 63 residents remained. Officially, they became squatters in houses they had owned for decades. In 2013, the remaining residents, which were fewer than 10, won a settlement against the state. Each was awarded $349,500 and ownership of their properties until they die, at which point Pennsylvania will seize the land and finally demolish what structures remain. Coming in at number 5, we have Grafton, Utah. Located just a few miles away from Zion National Park in Utah, the now abandoned town of Grafton can be found. The town was originally established in 1859 when five Mormon families nearby were led to establish a town they called Wheeler to plant cotton, which would have been a profitable commodity during the Civil War. After only two years, the town was struck by a massive flood starting on January 8th of 1862 that washed away the entire town. However, the pioneers did not give up that easily and moved about a mile upstream and founded a new town named Grafton. They grew cotton, alfalfa and wheat, but life was harsh and many residents lost their life due to the diseases and various accidents. The mortality rate was also extremely high, which accounts for about 77 total graves in the nearby cemetery. The town flourished for a while despite reoccurring floods, with a church and adobe schoolhouse being built in 1886, but when the Hurricane Canal was built in 1906, many families started to move to Rockville and Hurricane, and by 1920 only three families remained in the town, and in 1944 the town's last residents, Frank Russell and his wife Ellen, moved as well. And although the town is now well maintained by the non-profit volunteer organisation of the Grafton Heritage Partnership Project, its dark past can still be felt when exploring the area. People have reported hearing ghostly footsteps over the creaky floors and the empty buildings, as well as the breath of ghostly souls on the back of their necks. The entire town gives visitors a feeling as if being watched, and the shadowy figures can sometimes be spotted in the windows. Another visitor of the ghost town visited the basement of the Russell home and claimed that they found a chair sitting in the middle of the basement with a mark on it as if someone had recently sat on it. They had been exploring for over an hour at this point and had not encountered another person on the way to town or the entire time they were there, but for some reason the print looked brand new, with not a single speck of dust on it. After filming for a few moments in the basement and recording into the silence, they felt a rush of air, as if someone had just walked past them, which scared them, and they decided it was time to leave. There are even rumours of skinwalkers lurking in the area. Even the cemetery itself has many reports of people hearing crying, laughing and chilling screams, especially late in the day and when it's overcast. Some people have even seen a woman in a dress with her hair in a bun, walking around the cemetery, sobbing, but when they approached her, she disappeared into thin air. There is no doubt that there is definitely a very uncomfortable feeling while walking around the gravestones, which isn't surprising knowing the sad history of the people laid to rest there. In at number 4 we have Deadwood, South Dakota. The town of Deadwood is located in South Dakota and gained attraction in the gold rush of 1876. In 1875, a miner named John B. Pearson found gold in a narrow canyon in these northern Black Hills. This canyon became known as Deadwood Gulch because of many dead trees that lined the canyon walls at the time. Practically overnight, the tiny gold camp boomed into a town that played by its own rules that attracted outlaws, gamblers and gunslingers along with gold seekers. At its height, the city had a population of 5,000, attracting larger than life Old West figures back then. The business district comprised largely of saloons, dance halls, card parlours and bodacious bordellos. They were all hungry for gold and did whatever they had to in order to get some. The business did whatever they could to serve the gold diggers and sometimes that led to a little bit of conflict. Because of this, the now ghost town still lives with stories of its dead residents haunting present day hotels and saloons. In 1876, Deadwood survived a smallpox epidemic that nearly wiped out the whole town. There were so many infected that multiple tents were erected to quarantine the street. In addition, it suffered three major fires. One devastating fire occurred on September 26, 1879, destroying more than 300 buildings and consuming the belongings of many inhabitants. Many numerous economic hardships also followed, pushing it to the verge of becoming another Old West ghost town. One of the most paranormally active sites in the ghost town is the Adam House. Built in 1892, after owner W.E. Adams had a stroke on the premises, his wife was so disturbed by the sounds of his ghost still walking around, rocking the rocking
rocking chairs and so forth, that she moved and left the house untouched, exactly as it was when he died. Now, visitors and employees report having seen a rocking chair rock on its own, encountered a shadowy man standing at an upstairs window, and heard voices and footsteps in rooms throughout the house. In at number three, we have Garnet, Montana. Found in Montana, the abandoned town of Garnet was another gold rush town that drew thousands of hopeful miners. Between 1862 and 1916, gold was mined from the area. During the peak of the town, it had hotels, saloons, schools, and stores in the midst of the town's biggest years. A 1912 fire burned down half of the town, and what was lost was not rebuilt. Many of the remaining structures were in poor condition even when they were lived in and regularly visited. This marked the decline of the town as after 1917, the mine began to offer less and less, and by the time of World War One, the town was almost fully abandoned. Garnet is perhaps the best preserved coast town in the state of Montana. There are plenty of people who believe the abandoned buildings are still home to some of the residents who once lived there. Some visitors have reported hearing laughter and music coming from Kelly's saloon, which is the most common occurrence. I quote, We didn't experience anything bordering on the supernatural during our visit, but we did find the beautifully preserved artifacts to be windows into Garnet's incredible past. Coming in at number two, we have Jerome, Arizona. Located in Arizona, you will find the ghost town of Jerome. Once a copper mining town, Jerome was the third largest town in the early 1900s. His streets were filled with 30 37 saloons, 13 bordellos, and Amiga 4 churches in 1917, and again in 1926 after a mine blast damaged the original. A series of ill fated events at this site would almost lead one to call it cursed. When the Great Depression hit, conditions in the town took a sharp downturn. Plagued with man made disasters and poor fortune, Jerome's population gradually dwindled from thousands to somewhere between 20 to 50 residents. Finally, in 1950, the town was abandoned for good. A number of visitors have recounted other mysterious sightings. Visual apparitions range from human shaped figures that roam the halls and stairways of the old hotel, to a friendly animal that is said to scratch and meow at the doors. Additionally, one of the town's most well known ghosts is said to lurk at the town's community centre. Formerly called Lawrence Memorial Hall, the building is more often familiarly termed Spook Hall due to several strange happenings. With all the other apparitions wandering about this historic town, the cemetery of course known as the most haunted place in the whole town. Visitors here have made numerous numerous reports of dark figures moving about, the sound of ethereal footsteps and the sounds of distant voices. The old cemetery includes graves dating from 1897 to 1942. And finally, in the number one, we have Cerro Gordo, California. Cerro Gordo is a ghost town located in Death Valley and is considered one of the best abandoned places in California. Cerro Gordo means fat hills in Spanish. It was named this for the vast amount of silver it contained. By the end of 1869, the city flourished and became well known for its promising business. By 1871, Cerro Gordo was well established as a mining town. The American Hotel was completed that year, as were several other permanent structures a general store, restaurants, and saloons. At its height, the town had 5,000 residents. In 1875, Cerro Gordo suffered a series of setbacks, necessitating the shutdown of its furnaces. These problems resulted from a scarcity of ore in the mine, which had lasted for several months, and the temporary drying up of its water supply. In addition, by late 1876, a fire accident happened through some of the mine buildings and the union shaft, and the furnaces were closed the following February due to the disaster. A more lethal blow was dealt by falling lead and silver products. Crisis, effectively ending this era of activity at Cerro Gordo. Because of all the tragedy that occurred in Cerro Gordo, there has been multiple paranormal investigations held at the grounds of the abandoned town. While the new owner of the town was purchasing it, he was warned that they might have some visitors hanging around, and by visitors they meant spirits. One of the now owner's ghost stories goes along the lines of as he was walking toward the bunkhouse, he looked at the window, the curtain pulled to the side, and a little face poked out. Under the assumption that the contractors were staying in the bunkhouse, he asked when they were leaving, and he was told that they're gone for two weeks. So, a little uneasy, he locked up the door and went for a hike. By the time he got back, the kitchen light was on, even with a lock still on the door. In at number five, we have Batstow Village in New Jersey. Located in New Jersey, Batstow Village is a historic community centered around the Batstow Iron Works. The site was ideal for iron work because there was water for mills, abundant wood for charcoal, and naturally occurring bog iron. The well preserved and lovingly restored village dates back to 1766. As the operation of ironwork grew, so did the village. There were mills, cottages, and over three dozen structures and buildings.
buildings still remain, many from the early 1800s. But by mid 1800s, iron production declined due to the discovery of coal ore. As the need for iron declined, then glass making was pursued by the town, but at that point, the population already started to dwindle. When Joseph Wharton purchased the property, he primarily focused on forestry and agricultural endeavors. After Joseph Wharton passed in 1909, the property was managed by a trust. The state of New Jersey began buying the land in the 1950s. The last resident to leave the town left in 1936, but not before strange disappearances occurred. According to local legend and a bunch of conspiracy theorists, Ong's hat offers a portal to a different dimension. In the 1970s, a few professors from Princeton fled there after being mocked by their quantum physics theories. This is when they claimed to have discovered interdimensional travel. According to other local legends, the devil is the 13th born son of the Leeds, the first inhabitants of New Jersey. Mother Leeds gave birth to a healthy baby, who within minutes transformed into this beast. This old ghost town is said to be a hotspot for the Jersey Devil activity, and in the last 50 years there have been numerous reports and encounters with the beast in this area. Some of these encounters include strange tracks along with hearing screams just outside of the village. One sighting of the Jersey Devil comes from a group that saw the creatures crossing the street in front of them. When visiting the village, some say you can feel his presence as if he's walking right behind you. In at number 4 we have Bodie, California. Located up in the Bodie Hills in Mono County, California near Yosemite, in 1859 four miners found a good place to look for gold in the hills near the California Nevada border. Bodie died in a blizzard not long after, but a small mining town sprung up at their camp. The town was home to 10,000 people. Bodie was a mining camp in 1859 where people had seen gold in its hills. Eventually it turned into a well populated town. Though like most mining towns, it saw its peaks, its losses, and then its decline. Fast forward to 1962 and the town would be fully abandoned. Although it already showed signs of decline with dwindling numbers at the start of the 20th century, a series of fires forced the last remaining residents to flee the town, leaving it almost exactly as it was in the early 1900s. With the dinner tables still set, shops are still stocked with supplies, and restaurants are still poised to serve long forgotten meals. Today, the 110 silent building sits spaced out for traffic and people that aren't there. Buildings such as a barbershop, a church, a mill, a morgue, and a leaning hotel are hulled up by a beam and have been left untouched for 100 years. Though it has been left abandoned for years, some of the buildings are in a crumbling state of decay, while others stand strong, full of their original items, but long devoid of their owners. There were also 60 saloons and thus a fair amount of danger. People were robbed and crimes occurred quite often, though the curse of Bodhi has nothing to do with the fires or the sh things. It started because people started taking artifacts from abandoned buildings. They'd take weather-worn shoes or pieces of glass from shattered windows. Somebody once ran off with a piano. Those items may seem like they have no value, but all objects carry equal significance in telling the story of Bodhi. Thus, the curse of Bodhi emerged. If you take something from Bodhi, bad luck will come around to get you. Because of the rumor spreading of a curse, people who stole items would send them back, often including heartfelt apology letters, explaining that they didn't expect their their fish to pass or their romantic life to fail from stealing from Bodie. In at number 3 we have Tlingua in Texas. The town of Tlingua, Texas was once a bustling mining town full of life, wealth and promise. Today it's a ghost town with abandoned mine shafts, a general store, an old jail, a church and multiple ghost houses. Tlingua became of interest to local miners in the late 1800s when they discovered cinnabar, a red mercury sulfide. A man by the name of Jack Dawson discovered that mercury could be extracted from the cinnabar and by 1900 there were four four mining companies in the area with a population of over 2,000 people. The Chisos Mining Company owned the entire town of Tlingua. At one point they built a general store, a post office, a hotel, a school, a theatre and even a telephone service. Though conditions in the mine were tough, with the seven day work week being the standard, working long days in the desert heat led many miners to lose their lives in the mines. To make matters worse, the Chisos Mining Company even paid their workers in coupons, which could only be spent at the company owned store. The decline started once the mines dried up, companies left and the people left with them. One of the scariest parts of the town is the church, which sits on the hill above the ghost town. One quote says, as we approached the church, the door opened all by itself. Inside the church, visitors report an eerie feeling when entering the church. Moreover, several others report experiencing blackouts, blurred vision and even hallucinations while exploring the abandoned town. Researchers theorize that this is due to low frequency sound waves in the area that are able to alter people's perceptions of the things around them and 
around as well as disorient them. In at number two, we have Ludlow, Colorado. Located about 12 miles north of Trinidad, Ludlow, Colorado is a ghost town known for an infamous event in 1914. A former mining camp, it was the location of the Ludlow Massacre. Beginning in 1910, the resident coal miners grew unhappy over their dangerous working conditions and began to debate a strike. By 1913, a strike had begun, much to the dismay of owner John B. Rockefeller. On April 20th, 1914, there was a massacre in Ludlow, where the Colorado National Guard and Colorado Fuel and Iron Company guards attacked miners, burning their tents to the ground. Known as the Ludlow Massacre, 25 people lost their lives. The massacre was the height of the Colorado Coalfield War, which began a year earlier in 1913. Two coal mining counties, Las Animas and Hurufano, were the centers of the conflict. The United Mine Workers of America led the strike against the Colorado Fuel and Iron, owned by Rockefeller. They were upset over the horrible working conditions. Both parties led attacks back and forth over the years. Today, the old company town of Ludlow still stands as a ghost town, and the site of the tent city is also kept reserved, now under the care of the United Mine Workers of America. A monument to the deceased was also built by the Union at the site. In addition, the cellar where so many innocents perished is still in place. The doorway can still be seen and the dark depths of the pit can still be viewed. Though this isn't recommended as many people who visit the abandoned ghost town report a strange feeling when looking through the doorway, and even worse, possible whispers around them with an unexplainable source. And finally, in a number one, we have Helltown, Ohio. The abandoned town known as Helltown can be found in the Suyahoga Valley in Ohio. Thus, it's an eerie, deserted town known by locals to be haunted. No people live in the area anymore, though there are still remnants of the lives of former residents left behind. The whole town is surrounded by hazardous roads that seemingly lead to nowhere. Locals believe this was done to confuse any wandering explorers. But the Helltown Church seems to have inspired the town's ominous name. The tiny white church is in the center of Helltown and is central to all local theories. Some say the church was a place of worship for practicing Satanists who still lurk around the closed off roads, hoping to recruit unwelcome visitors. Others believe the town was evacuated after a chemical spill that resulted in bizarre mutations of the residents and animal population. The legend of the Peninsula Python stems from this theory. There even sits an abandoned school bus in the town with legends of its own. The story goes that the bus was carrying a group of high school students who were going to one of the ski resorts near Boston when an elderly woman flagged down the bus. She was in a panic state and explained that there was a young boy in her house who was seriously hurt. The bus driver, in an attempt to help, turned down her driveway and drove into the woods hoping to help the boy. When the bus approached the house, Satan worshippers swarmed it and sacrificed all those on board. The bus sat back there for over 30 years, standing as a warning to all who decide to venture into Helltown. A local paranormal investigator set out to research the abandoned town and to his surprise, what he discovered was truly frightening. He describes Helltown as not just truly abandoned, but is home to many spirits and hauntings. His personal experience with a ghost encounter was returning to his car to find strange people looking into his car windows. Both times, the people vanished as soon as they saw him approaching the car before he had a chance to speak to them. Coming in at number five, we have Goldfield, Arizona. Being deemed as one of Arizona's most haunted places, we have the town of Goldfield. Founded in 1893, Goldfield was a promising land for gold mining. The town grew rapidly, gaining 1,500 residents during its first year. The space was quick to build businesses, including stores, a blacksmith, a butcher, a brewery, and three saloons. Though the town of Goldfield met its fall just as quickly as it was built up. After five short years, the gold ran out and people began to dwindle, eventually leaving it fully abandoned, securing its ghost town status. Being classified as a ghost town doesn't necessarily mean a place is haunted by ghosts, but this is not the case for the Goldfield ghost town. There's plenty of documentation and investigations that point to Goldfield being a paranormal active ground. It is known that a mysterious figure lurks within the shadows of the Goldfield ghost town, Bordello. It is unclear who this spirit would have been in life, yet it is commonly believed he was once a miner who lived in the town. Unexplainable knocks and bangs are heard in the building and some unfortunate visitors have been scratched. This activity is attributed to a dark character who is usually seen wearing a cowboy hat. Just on the horizon of the Goldfield ghost town sits a landscape made ominous by its name and the legend surrounding it. The superstition mountains are cloaked in mystery and at the centre of many fables, making them notorious among the paranormal community. The superstition mountains carry many secrets, the most famous being the location of a supposed deposit of gold and riches in the lost Dutchman's gold mine. A curse has kept this treasure safe since the days of Goldfield's mining boom. Many have set out to locate these riches and many have returned empty handed or found only dead. 
death. Countless adventurers have perished in the Arizona heat pursuing this chase. Their ghosts are said to now haunt the mountainside. Other secrets of the mountain have people believing that the hill is a place where evil spirits hid and told stories of a devil that lived behind the mountain. There's also a rumored apparition of a hugely tall skeleton named the Borrego Phantom, which appears to those exploring the mountain after dark. Another layer of creepiness is added to the mountain by the local legend that reptile looking people surface there after dark. All of these creepy mysteries are summed up pretty nicely in the Superstition Mountains name. In at number 4 we have Glenrio, New Mexico. Found on the state border of Texas and New Mexico lies the town of Glenrio. Founded in 1901 it was a town where wheat and cattle farmers settled and grew a community, being divided between two states made for some unusual customs in Glenrio. The mail would arrive at a train depot on the Texas side but would have to be transported to the post office on the New Mexico side. The Texas side was part of a dry county so all the bars were on the New Mexico side. Because the gasoline tax was higher in New Mexico all the service stations were on the Texas side. By 1920 Glenrio had a hotel, a hardware store and a land office as well as several grocery stores, service stations and cafes. Though Glenrio's permanent population never rose above 30 people, the town survived with its tourist based businesses catering to the many travellers along route 66. By 1985 only two residents remained in the small town and the Texas post office was the only business open. It too has long since closed, other buildings have overgrown sites, missing windows or debris surrounding them. The detritus of four decades when Glenro welcomed tens of thousands, fed and entertained them and sent them on their way towards Chicago or California. In at number 3 we have Nevada City in Montana. Miners settled in Nevada City in 1963 along with establishing their homes and businesses in this new town. Located in southwestern Montana, the town is one and a half miles from Virginia City. The town was thriving up until 1876 when the gold miners moved to other promising sites. In 1896, the Connery Place and Mining Company destroyed most of the city's buildings. The company dredged the gulch and later abandoned it, leaving heavy wooden barges. This abandoned town being haunted is old news as the Nevada City Hotel is reported to be frequented by the apparition of a road agent who lost their life nearby, according to online sources. Visitors have also reported hearing footsteps in the hallways and seeing shadowy figures standing behind their reflections in mirrors. Additionally, the spirit of an older cowboy figure who never speaks but lurks in the hotel rooms and even sits at the bar in the Virginia City. Back when the hotel operated, guests also complained of a weeping woman, always in the same room, only to be told there was no guest in the room in question. In at number 2 we have Custer, Idaho. The mining town of Custer was born in 1879 by gold miners looking for their next gold hotspot. Prospectors discovered gold in what would become known as the Yankee Fork area of central Idaho in 1867. The area was worked worked on a small scale for more than a decade before the discovery of General Custer Mine. The General Custer Mining Company closed in 1888 and the district experienced a sharp decline. In 1899 the town of Custer has 5 saloons, 3 stores, a hotel and 3 boarding houses but the town never established even one church. By 1910 most of the mines in the area were closed and the Yankee Forks boom years came to an end. The combined population of Custer and the nearby Bonanza was just 66 people. The Silver Messenger reports just two families remaining in Custer in 1911 and then being fully abandoned the year following. Today it has been purchased by the US Forestry Service and in conjunction with the Friends of Custer Society is slowly being made into a historic site. Some original buildings have already been renovated, some are in process and many others are slated to be restored. Several buildings lost in a 1960s grass fire are due to be replaced with replicas. The Forgotten Town is a landmark for many people such as tourists and especially paranormal investigators. In the old school house is a museum containing items left behind and showcases the town's unique history. Although interesting you can't help but get an eerie feeling thinking about the people who once owned these items, as walking into one of these structures is like walking back in time. To think this town was once active with human energy and miners working every single day. And finally in at number 1 we have South Pass City, 
Wyoming. Only about 10 miles north of the Oregon Trail is the shell of a town that used to be a busy gold mining camp. Established in a small valley along the banks of Willow Creek, the town was born in 1867. The town was built there because gold was discovered in the Wind River Mountains. By 1868, South Pass City boasted over 250 buildings, 1,000 people, and hundreds of claims. The town was extremely busy as its half a mile long main street boasted numerous hotels, restaurants, general stores, two newspapers, doctors, a bowling alley, and dozens of saloons. The mining district continued to grow to as many as 3,000 residents. Miners looking for investors and newspapers promoting further settlement in the area exaggerated the region's amount of gold. But for South Pass City, its great success wouldn't last, and just two years after its establishment would begin to show its first signs of declining. Hitting a fall in early 1869, the town resurged briefly after outside of capital was poured into the area but would fall again as expenses and hardships to recover the gold proved too costly for most miners. By 1872 the town was only occupied by only a few hundred people. In the end South Pass would become a permanent ghost town. By 1949 the last of the pioneer families had moved on from South Pass City and the buildings had fallen into disrepair. The grounds of the old town were known to be haunted and Highway 287 that follows the route of the Oregon Trail over South Pass which is the reason South Pass City ever existed has had its fair share of ghost sightings. According to a local ghost story, a woman was driving home from a long day in Denver. Her friend had fallen asleep in the passenger seat. After passing through Jeffrey City, the driver spotted a dark hunched figure walking toward the road in the sagebush. About a half mile later she saw the same figure closer to the road. She noted his pig coat as he became clearer. About a half mile later, still thinking about this man and his surprising reappearance, she reached over to wake her friend and request she take a turn driving. As her friend awoke, she saw the same man at the edge of the road, just crossing the white line onto the highway next to the car. Screaming, they accelerated away and compared descriptions. It was certainly the same man. Number 5. Bannock, Montana Coming up first on our list of abandoned towns that might be home to something sinister is Bannock, Montana. This town is a notable hotspot for paranormal enthusiasts, due in part to featuring on Zach Baggins Ghost Adventures, and if he was involved, you know it's legitimate. It was founded in 1862, when John White discovered there was gold on Grasshopper Creek and the bells rang and all the prospectors rushed into them hills to strike gold and make it big. After that fortunate discovery, Bannock became your typical gold rush community in the wild west. That means a lot of people with missing teeth and big straw hats came in to come swing pickaxes at rocks looking for gold. An onset of prospectors and money meant that two bit hoodlums and varmints were soon to follow. The roads leading up to Bannock became a dangerous place, where holdups, robberies, and all kinds of high noon trouble became common. It became infamous as one of the most dangerous parts of Montana. The route leading into it had more robberies than any other stagecoach route in the country at the time. And the wildest thing about this already pretty Wild West tale is that the leader of the outlaws that had been raiding the stagecoaches on Bannock was Bannock's own sheriff. That is incredible. That's an M. Night Shyamalan twist. Certainly explains why they were able to get away with it for so long. Now with such a storied and troubled history of violence surrounding the town, is it any wonder that it's speculation that it's haunted? By the late 1860s, Bannock's gold rush began to fade, and it started to lose importance as a mining community to bigger things like Virginia City. While there were still people living in it all the way up until the 1950s, its trade diminished greatly, less gold, less money, less people, less crime fortunately enough but less of a community. Eventually the last few residents were displaced and the town would be converted into a state park. You can visit the decaying town now, kept preserved as if people should live there but don't. In a way, Bannock is much like these lives of all those prospectors and hopefuls cut short tragically, existing now just as a spooky memory of a different time. And if you're looking for more spooky stories, well Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. We've got a little bit of everything that freaks you out. Aliens, cryptids, ghosts, goblins, conspiracies, if it's spooky, we've got a video or two on it. So hit subscribe, make sure you hit that bell, and don't miss a single scream out of us. But hey, do that at the end of this video, okay? I got way more ghost towns coming up for you.
Well, four. I got four more ghost towns coming up for you. Number four, Kripke. You can't really have a video on scary ghost towns without including the most infamous ghost town in history, maybe. It both seems like it's a cop out to list it and also a mistake to ignore it. It's everybody's favorite irradiated town, Pripyat in Chernobyl. While reading about Chernobyl, I was introduced to the word kenopsia, which I hadn't heard before, meaning the feeling of seeing something that you know is supposed to be bustling and populated but isn't. And I think there are few places on earth that match that description quite like the exclusion zone. You look at it, and it seems like everybody literally left in a second, leaving behind their personal belongings, their things. It seems like at any moment, Chernobyl should come back to life, but won't. A safety test simulating a station blackout power failure would lead to a cataclysmic fire, leading to radioactive material being blown all over Pripyat and the surrounding areas, making it an inhospitable wasteland. 50,000 people used to live here, now it's a ghost town. Yeah, that line is from Call of Duty. I did steal that. Now Chernobyl, despite the fact that it is literally an irradiated wasteland straight out of the movies, is an above average popular site for tourists and would-be stalkers who want to explore around the exclusion zone for fun. I kind of understand it. I think I'd want to stand around, look around a bit, take it all in, and then immediately get out of there and go to a doctor. I'm not sure I'd spend too much time there personally. Now, as one might imagine, visiting the zone isn't as simple as walking on in and buying a ticket. For starters, the country is kind of busy right now, so not really the best time. But if you were to go, you're advised strongly to go with a guide or someone who knows the area very well due to how dangerous and unknown everything is out there. Avoid touching anything unnecessary, vegetation, or the wild dogs that roam the streets. They're very cute, but their fur is just a little bit too irradiated for me. You gotta wear boots, a mask, and an outfit that covers as much as possible to avoid any dust. You're asked not to enter buildings without approval, since some of them are so degraded that they could collapse under you at any second like the worst game of Jenga. It's kinda hard to look at stuff of Chernobyl and not feel like a pit in your stomach, you know? Looking at what happens when human indifference wreaks unspeakable havoc to the lands around it, poisoning the earth forever, radiating the animals, destroying people's homes and lives, and... But this ended on a bit of a bleak note, didn't it? <laughs> I'm sorry, this list of abandoned towns hasn't been more fun. I did try to look if maybe there was like an abandoned circus or like an abandoned Toys R Us that would have been fun to talk about, but it's mostly gonna be irradiated wastelands and places where everybody died. Sorry, sorry. Number three, Centralia, Pennsylvania. Coming up next on this list of spooky ghost towns is going to be Centralia in Pennsylvania. Now as far as ghost towns go, Centralia's got a bit of a Hollywood bug, serving as the inspiration for the titular town in the 2006 horror flick Silent Hill. Now as a Silent Hill mega fan, I feel the need to point out the video game version isn't based on this town, but it is mostly based on Kindergarten Cop. Look that up, it's a weird thing, but the school in Silent Hill, school in Kindergarten Cop, I don't know. Now Centralia, back to this one, was a once flourishing community wrecked by a coal mine fire that destroyed the town, leaving only fog and ash raining over the skies. In 1962, a fire started in a landfill and spread to the coal tunnels that lay deep beneath the city, thousands of feet below the surface of the town. Rescue crews tried their best to put out the raging flame, but the flame was too mighty to be quelled and eventually caught a coal seam that's still burning to this day. The town was abandoned. Windows boarded up, debris left in the roads, and never-ending clouds of smoke and fog circling the cracked roads, really getting that Silent Hill feeling. Now on paper, Centralia does not exist. The government removed its zip code, offices and buildings have all been abandoned, there's no services whatsoever. If you dial 911 in Centralia, nothing's gonna happen. The town has no infrastructure, so to speak of. It's a sad story, another disaster upending a town and the life that the residents had. Now although the town was evacuated, there are a few clingers who refuse to give up on the life they've known. Perhaps it's rebellion or sheer stubbornness, but there are still a handful of people living in Centralia. The last census said that there were five homes that still had people living in them. Talk about a small town, I bet everybody knows each other. While everyone else fled, these last few loyalists intend to live out the rest of their days in Centralia, refusing to let the town be taken from them. So no demonic entities in Centralia, really just some very tired residents who won't give up the ghost. If you ever visit, Make sure to be nice, okay? I feel like they've been through a lot. Number two, Verosha, Cyprus. Coming up next on our list is going to be Verosha in Cyprus. Once a shining playground for the glitzy and glamorous, this paradiso resort in the Mediterranean was a popular spot for the celebrities of yesteryear in the 1970s to get away from it all and 
put their feet up and stop worrying about the daily stresses of having a lot of money and being a movie star. That kind of lifestyle is taxing. The suburbs enjoyed a thriving tourist economy, with the golden sands and beachfront hotels being a force and enticing people to come. Of course, fame is fleeting and nothing in this world lasts forever, like celebrity resort towns. In 1974, Turkey would invade Cyprus and occupy the north in response to a Greek nationalist led coup. So the 15,000 people that lived in Varosha all up and fled the city in terror, leaving everything behind as it stood. Unfortunately, years of political strife and controversies in the area kept Varosha's residents from ever returning to their homes, leaving the city to rot in open air and decompose into a wasteland. One look at Varosha and it just seems like a tragic waste, trying to wipe you wrap your head around the money, livelihoods, industry, all just lost forever. It's a very eerie feeling looking at the photos of Varosha, seeing the earth try to take the city back. Buildings crumbling, trees sprouting through the bottom floors of cafes and restaurants. Well, why not just go in, fix the place up a little, you know, sweep up, clean it? Well, decades of neglect have done inconceivable damage to the infrastructure. The city has crumbled and wasted away so much that experts estimate that it would take upwards of $12 billion to make the decrepit city livable once again. So for the time being, it'll probably remain as a time capsule, frozen from better years where things were bright for this forgotten city. Number 1. Uridur Songlas Our final entry for this list today is going to be the somber story of the village of Uridur Songlas, an abandoned town in France. Infamous for being host to one of the worst massacres in French history during the Second World War. It's believed that the attack was an act of revenge because of the village's support of the resistance. So as retaliation, German soldiers rounded up 642 residents and killed them and burned the houses to the ground. Some were fired at while others were locked in a church that was burned. The only people from the village who managed to survive the horror were those that played possum and fled out into surrounding forests after the invading soldiers had all left. After the war had ended, nearby there was a new Orador sur Glace built nearby. But the original village, what's left of it at least, was ordered to be left untouched by President Charles de Gaulle, who insisted the village must be left standing as a monument to honor the dead who had been wrongfully taken too early. So, not quite a ghost town in the sense that there's stories of hauntings or chills through the night, but haunting in a certain sense, definitely. In fifth place, we have Isla de las Municas, Mexico. Decided to kick off today by being an overachiever. This is an entire abandoned island. The island of the dolls in Mexico is like something straight out of a horror movie, but my kind of horror movie. Located on Tishuilo Lake, it is home to hundreds of hanging, slowly decaying dolls, thanks to a man named Don Julian Santana. Over 50 years ago, Don Santana left his wife and child and moved on to an island on Tishuilo Lake in the Exocamilicos Canal. According to him, a young girl actually drowned in the lake in the 1950s, and Don Julian Santana devoted his life to honoring this lost soul by collecting and hanging up dolls by the hundreds. Eventually, he transformed the entire island into a doll infested wonderland. Now, he began collecting lost dolls from the canals and the trash near his island home. He's also said to have traded produce if he grew to locals for more dolls. Don didn't really clean up the dolls or attempt to fix them, but he rather put them up with missing eyes and limbs, covered in dirt, and generally in whatever ramshackle state he found them in. Even when dolls arrived in good shape, the wind and weather turned them into cracked and distorted versions of themselves. Don also kept his cabin filled with the dolls, which he dressed in headdresses, sunglasses, and other various accessories. Despite the fact that most people found the island frightening, Don saw the dolls as beautiful protectors, and he welcomed visitors, whom he would, you know, show around, charging a small fee for taking photos. In 2001, Don Santana was found drowned in the same area in which he believed that that small child had passed away. According to legend, the doll in the island are haunted by the spirits of the dead girl and perhaps even by Don himself. Okay, who wants to go on a road trip with me? Anyone? Oh, thanks. In fourth place, we have Pripyat, Ukraine. So Pripyat is an abandoned city in northern Ukraine, located near the border with Belarus. Named after the nearby river of the same name, it was founded on February 4th of 1970 as the Ninth Atomgrad, which was a type of closed town in the Soviet Union to serve the nearby Chernobyl nuclear power plant, which was located in the adjacent ghost city of Chernobyl. So Pripyat was officially proclaimed a city in 1979 and had grown to a population of around 49,000 by the time it was evacuated on the afternoon of April 27th of 1980. One day after the Chernobyl disaster, making it younger as a city at that time than I am now. Although it was located within the administrative district of Ivankiv Rayon, the abandoned municipality now has a status of city of regional significance within the larger Kyiv Oblast and is administered directly from the capital of Kyiv. 
Pripyat is also supervised by the State Emergency Service of Ukraine, which manages activities for the entire Chernobyl exclusion zone. So following the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear disaster, the entire population of Pripyat was moved to the purpose-built city of Slavutich. At the time of the evacuation, the average age of residents was about 26 years old, and the city housed 13,414 apartments in 160 apartment blocks, with 18 halls of residence accommodating up to, let's say, 7,600 single males or females, and eight halls of residence for married couples. In terms of education, there were 15 kindergartens and elementary schools for 4,980 children, each with their own nickname, and five secondary schools for about 6,000 students. In 2019, it was announced that folks could start visiting the affected areas if certain health and safety procedures were followed, but I don't feel like visiting a radiation-affected city is high up on my bucket list at this point in time. In third place, time to visit the Bodie State Historic Park. So formerly a genuine gold mining town, located east of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, in Mono County, California, and now a national landmark, it is known as one of the best preserved ghost towns in the world. It is named after W.S. Bodie, first name unknown, but rumored to be either William or Waterman who discovered gold in 1859 in an area now known as Brody Bluff. He tragically passed in a snowstorm that same winter, and was never present for what came to be. According to pioneer Judge McClinton, the district's name was changed from the proper spelling of B-O-D-E-Y to B-O-D-Y, and then a few other phonetic variations, to eventually B-O-D-I-E, after a painter in the nearby boomtown of Aurora led her to sign as such, uh, you know, an accidental typo that stuck through history, which is a good reminder to proofread your work. I don't do it enough. While the output from the mine is largely insignificant in terms of mining history, the violence and early endings to lives tell a different story. In a particularly harsh winter between 1878 and 79, claimed hundreds of lives, with many others perishing from falling timbers and explosions underground. So Bodie as a town grew to have a reputation for violence and lawlessness. And unlike other mining camps at the time, killings were uh, daily events. Robberies, stage holdups, and fights happened at such a frequency that no complete record could be kept. Reverend F. M. Warrington would describe the area area in 1881 as a sea of sin, lashed by the tempests of lust and passion. The first of four mysterious fires tore through the business district in 1892, the next destroying the town mill in 1912, and another destroying the same mill again in 1898. The last of the unknown fires demolished most of what was left of the now ghost town in 1932, taking many lives way too soon in the process. So when the last producing mine shut down after 1945, very few people were left living in what was left of the town, and all eventually met untimely ends. One man shot his wife unprompted, and three other men from the town took it upon themselves to take his life for that act. So according to historians, the ghost of that man would visit the three men after his passing, shaking his fist and appearing as if he was cursing them out. Those men soon died of mysterious diseases and illnesses. Visitors to the area have reported meeting spirits that leave them feeling suffocated, seeing doors open and close on their own, and rocking chairs that may or may not have a menacing older lady staring them down, or even the empty chair rocking on its own. Though Bodhi might be a bit of a tourist destination nowadays, but if you remove anything from the land, like I'm talking like a pebble, you'll be cursed with remorse and tragedy. The park keeps a logbook of all letters and items returned to them, with each thief writing an apology note to Bodhi for what was taken. The curse is upheld by the ghosts of residents past who guard against thieves and protect the town's treasures. Okay, so kleptos, steer clear or be cursed. In second place, we have the island of Poveglia. Yep, another entire abandoned island. This one's a little creepier though. So the island is located in the lagoon near Venice, and is famous for being one of the most haunted places in Italy. Tourists and locals alike are banned from the island, which was used for centuries as a place to exile the sick to prevent the spread of disease and contain the mentally ill in an asylum built in the late 1800s. Yes, I'll backtrack and elaborate. So in 1348, the bubonic plague arrived in Venice and Poveglia, like many other small islands at the time, and it became a quarantine colony. The plague on average killed like one out of three Europeans, by the way. So fearing the unbridled spread of the disease, Venice exiled many of its symptom-bearing citizens there. So at the island center, the dead and those too sick to protest were burned on giant pyres. So this included the tens of thousands of Venice citizens just dying on the mainland. Those fires would burn once more in 1630, when the Black Death again swept through the city. The small island was used as a mass burial ground, and ashes from human remains make up as much as 50% of the island's soil. 
Cripes, I, uh, I hope it's a good fertilizer. The deaths of nearly 160,000 people on the island have given it its nickname, the Island of Ghosts. A doctor at the asylum was known to have experimented on patients with crude lobotomies and jumped from the bell tower in the late 1930s after claiming he had been driven mad by ghosts. Decades later, nearby residents claimed to still hear the bell, although it was removed many years earlier. A report titled Haunted History states that some restoration work had started in recent history but abruptly stopped without explanation. Okay, maybe this is one spot on today's list that I might not want to visit. And in first place, we have St. Elmo in Colorado. St. Elmo is a ghost town and allegedly the best preserved ghost town in all of Colorado, while also boasting the most hauntings and paranormal activity of any ghost town in the state. The town was a major gold and silver trading center and hub of life for many pioneers, outlaws, and miners for decades. So it was originally called Forest City, but St. Elmo was settled in 1878 and became an official township in 1880 with the arrival of the first post office. So the residents of the town were forced to change the name because there were already too many forest cities in the area. So gotta applaud the originality. St. Elmo went through a massive gold rush, reaching the height of its population of 2,000 residents in only 10 days. The majority of the town worked in one of the four local markets. Mines. The Mary Murphy mine was the most profitable mine and the longest operating, having produced over $60 million worth of gold while it was in operation. When the mines began to close down, the town began to dwindle. The Mary Murphy mine continued to operate until 1922, but was shut down when the railroad was abandoned. Postal service was discontinued in 1952 after the death of St. Elmo's postmaster. Now for the fun part ghost stories. I saved the best for last for a reason. The most famous ghost of St. Elmo is Annabelle Dirty Annie Stark, not to be confused with the beloved Annabelle doll. This Annabelle is the descendant of Anton and Anna Stark, who arrived in St. Elmo with the Pacific Railroad in 1881. Anton was a section boss in the mines, while Anna ran the Home Comfort Hotel located on Poplar Street and the General Store. Oh, and both structures are still standing today. Anna Stark was known as a cruel and harsh woman who never allowed her three children, Roy, Tony, and Annabelle, out in the town to mingle or work alongside what she deemed the simple town folk. Annabelle grew up attractive and passionate for the town, and her love of St. Elmo was fierce. After the death of her mother, Annabelle and Tony inherited the hotel, and the once impeccably clean establishment fell to shambles. So along with the decline of the town, Annabelle began to lose her grasp on reality. The town soon called her Dirty Annie because she would emerge in filthy clothing and her hair was in a tangled mess all the time. Finally, free of the harsh rule of her mother, most people assumed this was her like quiet rebellion. Residents remember strolling the main street with her firearm loaded and hung over one shoulder, ready to protect the town from anyone who dared to threaten it. Since her death, it is told she can still be found roaming the streets. Only a short while after after Annabelle had passed away, the hotel was left to a family friend whose grandchildren were playing inside the hotel, when suddenly all of the doors slammed shut and the temperature dropped 20 degrees. The children cried and screamed, and finally the room returned to the outside temperature, and the door slowly swung open. Oh, that's not the only ghost story. Don't worry. A woman skiing down Poplar Street at dusk was struck by a peculiar sight of a lovely looking woman in a long white gown glaring out of the second story window of the Home Comfort Hotel. Now the skier was shocked. She knew the owner of the hotel was on vacation and nobody was supposed to be inside. As she turned to see what the woman was eyeing, she noticed snowmobiles approaching. So sidebar, snowmobiling is illegal in St. Elmo. So the skier went and advised the group who promptly apologized and went back where they came from. When she turned back to look at the hotel, the woman in the window was still watching and she lowered her head, nodded at the skier turned and vanished before her eyes. So curious and in disbelief, the skier went back the next day to find every window and door were locked. When the owner of the hotel returned, the two women searched the property with nothing to be found. So was it Annabelle keeping watch? Be sure to let me know in the comments what you think.